Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Only patience and nothing else allows us to enjoy the present moment that we have. If I'm somewhere and I don't want to be there, and I'm wanting to be somewhere else, let's just say I'm waiting at the airport. I don't want to wait at the airport, but my plane's late. I don't want to wait. Well, too bad, the plane's not here. So I'm going to wait. So I can either sit there and be frustrated, or I can say, well, God, I believe my times are in your hands, and so I'm just going to find some way to enjoy this. I believe that one of the things that drives the devil absolutely mad, how many of you would love to give the devil a nervous breakdown? I think one of the things that just drives him mad is when we can learn how to enjoy every single thing that we do, no matter how mundane it is. Uh, yeah, a lot of you ain't so sure about that. You're like, <laughs> I love it when you get three people clapping. You know, God doesn't want us just to enjoy Fridays and vacations and parties and when we're getting to buy something that we want. He wants us to enjoy every single solitary moment that he gives us, every moment, because the greatest present that God ever gives is the present moment that we have. The present moment that we have. So I want to ask you to, not right now while I'm speaking, but later on today or sometime in the next couple of days, take the time and get really honest with yourself and ask yourself, how much of my life do I really enjoy? See, a lot of times we don't even think about it. Well, I've, I've actually been on this journey for many, 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 many years because I got a real revelation out of John 10, 10. The thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came that you might have and enjoy your life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. So although Jesus died primarily for our salvation, he also died that we might be able to enjoy every single solitary moment of our lives. Not just a few here and there, but every single solitary moment of our lives. I believe that one of the greatest tragedies in life is not to enjoy every single moment that God is giving us. I wrote a book a long time ago called Enjoying Where You're At on the Way to Where You're Going. My goodness. When I think about even my ministry, there was so much of it that I didn't enjoy because I was so intent on trying to get it to grow. I recall one time being in a meeting much smaller than this, and there was maybe four or 500 people there, and there were a lot of leaders there. And so I just thought, well, I would, I would just pray for all the ones who weren't enjoying the ministry. And so I said I would just you know, like to offer to pray for any, any person who's in ministry that you can honestly say you're really not enjoying it, and I could not believe it. I mean, there were literally hundreds of people in ministry called to do the greatest job on the face of the earth, but they weren't enjoying it. You know why? Because they were trying to get somewhere where they weren't. If my church could just be a little bigger, if I could just have a new building, we're always going to be happy when, when we get married, when the man we married stops telling us what to do. When we get a bigger house, when we get a housekeeper to clean the bigger house, when we get a housekeeper that doesn't irritate us while they're cleaning the house. Come on. Anybody with me? When we get a different job, when we get a promotion on our job, no, 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 no. If you can't enjoy life right now, you're never going to enjoy it. When? Because it's not about what we're doing. It's something in our attitude. And I'm pretty intent at this point, and I would imagine a lot of the rest of you are, 
I'm pretty intent on really trying to glorify God in my everyday life. I can tell you, God is not so interested about who's in this church building this morning. It's not that he doesn't care that you're here or see that you're here. He loves the whole thing. But it's more about what we do when we leave here that God cares about than how we behave in here. And we can jump up and down and shout and clap to every song that we sing, but it's still about how I act when I'm in the line at the grocery store. How do I behave if God's not moving as fast as I want him to? What happens when I have somebody working for me that is a valuable person, but they're just, it just takes them longer to learn, and I have to tell them over and over, how am I going to act them? Am I going to write them off because they're not as fast as me, or am I going to make an investment and work with them a little bit more? Am I going to have enough wisdom to not compare one of my children to the other because one of them actually suits my personality better than the other one? You know, we can love all of our kids and not like all of them. <laughs> Come on, a lot of you wouldn't admit that, but I mean, I, my older son, I just didn't like him. <laughs> and he knows it. I mean, he's 48 now, so that's all cool, you know. You're thinking, my gosh, 48, how old are you? <laughs> old enough to know what I'm talking about. So <laughs> that means listen up. I've been there, done that. I've tried it every way you can try it. And I know what works and what doesn't. I know what's going to make you happy and what's going to make you miserable. Let me save you about a thousand trips around the same stupid mountain by just listening real closely this morning. You're not going to rush God. You're not going to change people. Only God can change people. Pray for people. They're going to package stuff, so just learn how, Joyce, to take it off and shut your mouth. <laughs> I've got a colic here on the side of my hair. I'm probably all my life going to be doing this. Just, so just do it and be quiet. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And whatever you do, learn how to enjoy the drive to work in the morning. Learn how to enjoy sitting next to that person at work that you really aren't that crazy about their personality, but remind yourself that God loves them anyway. <laughs> Learn how to do that job that you're not real crazy about, and you just think, well, I'd be happy if I could get a promotion. Do you know how many people are bed-bound and would love to have your job? Do you know how many people would love to be able to get up and go to the job that you hate and despise? Or how many people have to walk everywhere they go and they would not mind at all driving in the traffic that we have a problem with every single day? <laughs> and you know what? You come to church on Sunday and be reminded of these things and everybody agrees we all know it's right. But I'll tell you where you got to remind yourself when you're by yourself. Have a meeting with yourself and talk to yourself. We read that scripture last night in Ephesians 4 that says set your mind and your attitude every day. Every single day we have to set our attitude. You know, I believe that we are people that are anointed to live ordinary everyday life in a very supernatural way. I don't think that we can expect something spectacular going on all the time. God is in the ordinary. He's there in all the simple little things that we sometimes just rush through and then we miss what God is doing or the opportunities that God's giving us to be a blessing to somebody else because we're already hating the ordinary thing. Let's look at James 5, 7. So be patient, brethren, as you wait, not if you wait. Be patient as you wait until the coming of the Lord. Now watch this. See how the farmer waits expectantly for the precious harvest from the land and how he keeps up his patient vigil over it until it receives the early and the late rain. You know, we can just feed past that verse and never really get too much out of it, but 
through my efforts to study patience over the years, I've taken a lot of these scriptures apart and really dug into them. And so if you think about this farmer, he digs up fallow ground, he puts his seed in the ground, and he waits, and he waits, and he waits, and he waits. What day is something going to come up out of the ground? Only God knows. So what does he do? He just keeps doing what he should do. He waters it. He pulls the weeds. He looks at it. He gets up. He goes to bed. He gets up. He goes to bed. It's Monday. It's Tuesday. It's Wednesday. It's Thursday. It's Friday. Nothing's happening. He starts the same thing all over next week, next week, next week. But there's a little word in here that I don't even know if it's in the other translations, but it's become a huge, huge word in my life. And it says, he waits expectantly. Now, come on, you're about to get something here. The big reason why we're unhappy many times is not because of our circumstances. It's not even that we're having to wait. It's that we're waiting without expectancy. Something amazing happens in my soul, and I believe it will in yours too, when I start aggressively, purposefully expecting that something good is going to happen in my life at any moment. Today may be the day when my harvest is coming. Today may be the day when I'm going to see a change in my children. Today may be the day when I'm going to feel better. I've put up with this physical thing for yay and how long, but today may be the day. You see, the devil wants us to be hopeless. And we sang that beautiful song earlier about hope. Be full of expectancy. I've trained myself every morning when I get up, I am not up five minutes. Probably now it's down to a minute or two minutes. And this is what you hear me say now. I'm expecting something good to happen to me today. I'm expecting something good to happen through me today. Today I'm going to be strong. I'm going to feel good. I'm going to be energetic. And I'm going to be creative. I am excited about today. This is going to be a great day. And I can tell you the absolute truth. If you will do that, your body will respond. Your, your physical being will respond. And you are going to start to feel better. And life is going to look better to you. Man, we'll work on it a while till you get it. You see, passive people are just like, mm. I don't know, we'll see. I, ta I taught a message recently called, as you get up and go, got up and gone. And, you know, we all have times where we get tired of doing what we're doing. Everybody. You think if you had a more exciting job, you wouldn't get tired of that one? Yes, you would. You might sit out there and think, oh, I wish I was Joel, I wish I was Victoria, I wish I was, uh, I wish I was Joyce. Well, you know what? I get tired of doing what I'm doing. You know what I was thinking sitting down there this morning? It's not that I don't want to be here, I want to be here. But I thought I would love to get in a church service sometime and have nothing to do. Do you know how many years it has been? <laughs> But I could just go sit and have no responsibility. And see, while you're enjoying the worship, even if I'm in a service like this where it's not my own meeting, in my own meetings, I don't even get to really rest during the worship. But even in this, I, I still got to be thinking about what I'm going to say and what I'm going to do. And you know what I get tired of more than anything occasionally, and I'm anointed for it, I'm good at it, is always being responsible for something everywhere I go. Well, I would have just thought if I had your life. <laughs> you never get one side of anything without getting the other side. If you get the promotion at work that you want, you're going to have more responsibility. They're going to expect more out of you. The, the higher you climb the ladder and the more people that are under your authority, the more people are going to be that aren't going to like you. Come on now, do you know when you're the boss, I don't care what decision you make, Everybody's not going to like it. You know, another thing that I get tired of, and I'm just being honest with you today. This is something I had to do by faith. I just wish that I could have this ministry and do it all and never have to ask anybody again for money. You just get 
tired of that sometimes when you're in our position. So let me tell you, when people start talking about the offering, smile, cheer, act like you like it because it's not easy on us. <laughs> Come on. Come on now. You know, well, I'll just be so glad when my kids are grown and they're gone. No, let me tell you, when they're grown, they just cost more money than they did when they were little. <laughs> and then you not only have the kids, you have the son-in-laws, the daughter-in-laws, and then all the grandkids that, you know, it's like, oh my God. Junior's got to go to college, and Sammy's got to do this, and somebody else has got to do something else, and you know. And so anyway, I put a sign up in my house. I childproof my home, but they keep getting in. <laughs> and hey, I love my kids. My kids are my life. But I'm just telling you that, you know, we're always wanting something that we don't have, and in the process, we miss what we do have. Stop being so upset about what you don't have that you forget to enjoy what you do have. When somebody does something wrong, don't forget all they've done in your life that was right. How about if we start really celebrating what we do have instead of being bothered all the time by what we don't have? Expectancy. When I have one of those days where I feel like my get up and go has got up and gone, and I'm just, I'm just telling you the truth, I'm letting you into my personal life, do with it what you want. I get up, I'm out in another hotel, and I'm, you know, listen, I love what I'm doing. I'm so grateful to serve God, but I got a soul just like everybody else. You think Paul and his family don't, don't ever get tired of being in Africa or somewhere for three months? I told Dave this morning, I said, I, I so admire them for doing that. You know, I'll go to the mission field, but I want to go and get back home. I want my stuff. I want my coffee. I want my water. You know. So I'm like a five-star missionary. I'll go, but we better, you know. <laughs> I'm not the tent type, but don't work for me. And, I mean, I've been in these places where they're going and living, and I just want to tell you what, you guys have my appreciation and my respect. <laughs> Amen? When I have one of those days when I get up and I'm like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh Jesus. <laughs> Lord, do you know how old I am? Mm. Okay. Mm. You know what helps me more than anything? I'm expecting something good to happen today. I'm expecting God to show up and show out. I'm expecting somebody to be healed physically today while I'm preaching the Word. I'm expecting salvation. I'm expecting to get to be a blessing to somebody today. I am full of expectancy. And you know what happens when I do that? I start to get excited. I start to get enthusiastic. You know, we need to have a little more fire. What looks better in a fireplace, cold ashes or a blazing flame? Amen? I believe that we need to be more excited, and the way to do that is to live with expectancy. Now, after I taught this in my chapel a couple weeks ago, I got a report the next day that one of the girls at the office was on her way home, and she thought, well, I'm just going to try this because she has a son that just really gives her a lot of trouble. And she said, I just have a tendency to dread going home. How I many of you know sometimes when you got trouble at home, you can just dread walking in the door one more time? It's like, oh, God. She said, so while I was driving home, I said, I am expecting something good to happen tonight with my son. She said she wasn't in the house very long, and her son looked at her, and he said, Mom, I just want you to know I love you. She said, I have not heard that in months and months and possibly years. Let me tell you something. What we think and what we say, the attitude that we live with does affect our circumstances. Now, I'm not going to tell you that you can get anything you want just by saying I'm expecting it, but I will tell you that you can put up with so much more than what you could even imagine if you will have some enthusiasm, some fire, and be excited. And don't expect somebody else to come along and do this for you. Paul told Timothy, stir yourself up. Yeah. 
in the Lord. You stir yourself up. And what I have given you here in the last two minutes is so valuable. I'm telling you, God has called me to preach the word, and I believe that I hear things from him for the body of Christ, and this expectancy thing is not a little thing. It is a big thing, and God is waiting to bring your harvest. You may have to put your seed in the ground and get up and go to bed 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 until you think you can't stand it anymore, but if you do it with expectancy, wow, some good things are going to happen in your life. Amen. Come on, give God a praise. I'm expecting something good to happen to me. And I'm expecting something good to happen through me. Now, listen, everybody be real still for just a moment. You're here today, somebody brought you as a guest, or maybe you came because you see Joel on TV and you're a little disappointed that you got me instead of him, but <laughs> that's all right. You got exactly what you needed. Our Maybe you heard I was going to be here and you came to see if I really look like I do on TV. I don't know what you know. But the point is you're here. And if you're not right with God today, if you have not received Christ as your Savior, it's so easy. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to straighten yourself up before God will have you. He wants you right now. He brought you here today for this purpose. This can be the best decision that you will ever make in your life. All you have to do is say, yes, I believe in Jesus, and yes, I'm tired of living the way I'm living. I want peace. I want joy. I want to have a really good friend. Jesus wants to be your friend. You know, becoming a Christian doesn't just mean that you get this list of 10 things you need to do now that are all religious things. It means that you're invited into an intimate, personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and that He wants to be involved in every single thing that you do. It's wonderful, just wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. You know, as a believer in Jesus Christ, we all have the fruit of patience in our spirits. God has put it there as a seed. But we have to develop it. God wants us to develop that and to, and to become strong in that fruit of patience. And the way that we do develop it is by having opportunities to use it. And you know, sometimes God wants us to wait patiently on His timing so He doesn't do what we'd like Him to do right away. He wants us to trust Him in all things and to really learn how to enjoy every single moment of our lives. And that's not gonna happen if we're frustrated and upset all the time because things aren't happening as fast as we would like them to. This community likes boys, so they want their boys to go to school first. The girls, they don't have any, any value when it comes to education for them. So if they can get some money for her and not have the burden of having to care for her, it helps the family. The flags that you see on the homes over my shoulder represent a long-standing tradition that is very difficult on girls. As soon as a very young girl reaches puberty and she's of childbearing years, you'll see these flags above their houses representing the fact that a young girl is available to a man, essentially on the market, up for sale. And at that point, her life changes dramatically. So what they do is they take him out of school and they'll actually go through different activities, teaching them how to cook, how to be a, a wife in the, in the home. But part of it is also how to please a man. And that's through, you know, normal things in the house, but also sexually. So they teach them different things about sexuality and so on. So we are doing anything that we can to help people understand the value of girls. That's the key. And helping these girls by taking them into a program <laughs> called Imagine Hope. 
if they would live with us for six months and we would have devotions, lead them to the Lord, really mentor them in how to be a godly woman, and then at the same time teach them how to do some skills, basic things like jewelry making or whatever it is, that they can have some kind of an income that they can bring to their families. This is a good hat. Were you afraid when you thought that you were going to have to be married? Some of my friends, they are already married now, but they are used to suffer in that marriage. So if myself, I was afraid to be married while I'm still young, but because of this program, my mom, she didn't take me to the marriage, but she bring me here so that I can proceed with my education, so that I can help her in future change our situation. I, I'm so grateful. I wish I could bring everyone here and let them see the impact of what's happening. Um, and I'm grateful for it because we should give. And we should give to those that we don't benefit us. And I think that's what Hand of Hope does and, and we're grateful for that. We are helping young women like this all over the world. Help us to guide, restore, and love young girls. Your designated gift today, if you choose, can go to Project Girl. Or you can give toward water, you can give toward feeding, and do something that you know will make a difference. Well, have you ever wanted to help hurting people, but you feel like you can't make a difference? I want you to know that you can. When we work together, we can feed hungry children, rescue women from human trafficking, and help victims of natural disasters. Uh, that's just few of the things that we can do. And I'm asking you, if you're not a partner with our ministry, I'm asking you to partner with us, to become a financial partner with the ministry. And that means that you do something on a regular basis, monthly or, or quarterly, but we need people all over the world helping us so we can keep reaching hurting people. And honestly and truly, what each one of us can do by ourselves is minute compared to what we can do if we put it all together. And so I'm inviting you to join the family today and make an amazing difference all over the world for God's glory. You can be a world changer. Er zijn veel manieren om tijd met God door te brengen. Maar hoe kunnen we echt van dag tot dag dicht bij hem zijn? In dit zeer persoonlijke dagboek schrijft Joyce over haar stille tijd met God en over de inzichten die ze tijdens deze momenten heeft ontvangen. Laat je inspireren en ervaar daarbij dagelijks een verfrissende diepte in je relatie met je hemelse Vader. Bestel nu Mijn Tijd met God via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100. Hoe zit het met een dagelijkse inspiratie? Inspirerende gedachten levert de dagelijkse overdenking van Joyce per e-mail. Meld je gratis aan 